We're a nation built on freedom, but freedom isn't free. We're a nation built on sacrifice, a land of liberty. And the cross is on a thousand fields around the world today. Are a testimony to the price brave soldiers had to pay. And so I'm thankful for those who stand up for the red, white, and blue. For those who put their lives on the line. And I'm proud to say that I live in the USA. This is the land of the free. This is the home of the brave. This is the land of liberty, the USA. So as time has come and time has gone in the land of the free, we've had soldiers rise and soldiers fall for our right to liberty. And now we honor them and their families for the sacrifice they made. Yet our nation stands as a citadel for the price that they paid. So I'm thankful for those who stand up for the red, white, and blue, for those who put their lives on the line. And I'm proud to say that I live in the USA. This is the land of the free. This is the home of the brave. This is the land of liberty, the USA. But those who laugh at God and reject his son must hear God's saving grace. So this land we love might know the truth that our sins he can wash away. And so I'm thankful for those who stand up for the Bible and for truth, for those who put their Good morning, would you please stand with me? We're going to sing together, oh beautiful for spacious skies. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. If you'd like to use your hymn books, it's number 127, else the words will be behind me on the screen. Let's sing together number 127. Lift your voices as we sing together. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, 
four purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful, for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine, till all Success be nobleness and every gain divine. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Please remain standing as the honor guard of the Marine Corps Le League Morris F. Dixon Jr. Detachment Number 54 of Clearwater, Florida, post the colors. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and then the National Anthem by the Clearwater Christian College Ensemble. Gentlemen, please post the colors. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Thank you for being here today, and we're certainly honored that each of you have cho chosen to worship with us and join us in honoring uh, our heroes here in our community, Pinellas County, those that serve us on a daily basis, and then those that serve around our country and around the world. And uh, we're certainly thankful, and uh, we're a humble people because of what others do for us. And so, as the Scripture gives admonishment to give honor to whom honor is due, that's what today is all about. We want to honor these men and women, and we're going to introduce several of them to you in a few moments. But let's begin the day with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless uh, these events. Father, your grace is sufficient in all things. And Lord, we come to you a humble people recognizing that, Lord, without you, uh, the things of this world, the things of this country could not be explained. There is an obvious creator because of the creation. And Lord, we come to acknowledge you first. And then, Lord, as Christians in America, we thank you for the privilege to be born in this place, have been given so much that so much is required of us to give to others and to, Lord, share the blessings of America with the world and even those in our own communities. Thank you for these men and women that we'll meet today. And as we do our best in a very simple way to try to honor them and thank them for their time their service, and many, their sacrifice. Lord, we pray that you'd be pleased with that. But most of all, Lord, may you be pleased with the fact that we make much of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. For if Christ be not risen from the dead, we're, in all, we're of all men most miserable. But because you live, Lord, there's life for each of us. And may people know that today is our goal. Thank you again for your blessing on America. May we not forget it. And God, may we fight to keep it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This day was born in my heart about 10 years ago after we began to watch men and women from our church family in Groves, Texas, being called into service as reservists and watch them as they deployed to Afghanistan. And we recognized the great hole left behind in their family, uh, in their churches, uh, in their jobs. And we began to realize that we don't do enough for our public servants, for our first responders, for our military. And so this day began to formulate, and we've been doing it every day, uh, every year since then. And of course, we do it around the time of 9-11, because really there was no greater example of what a first responder does than the events of 9-11, as many were fleeing buildings, first responders were rushing into buildings giving their lives to try to save others. We watched our policemen, we watched our firemen, we watched our emergency personnel try to rescue as many. And I, I would dare say the numbers would be far greater in the tragic loss of 9-11 had it not been for the men and women who gave their own life to save so many. And so we as a, com a community and as a church uh, take this day, the Sunday prior to 9-11, to say thank you. And I've met many policemen before Normally, it's on the wrong end of a speeding ticket. But uh, on days like this, I want to have a, a very slow, safe drive into church and then thank them for their service. And we're certainly honored that you're here with us. Our church families work very hard, and uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful time together. I want to thank Dr. Caceres and the Clearwater Ensemble uh, for providing the music today. And uh, our church family, you've been exceptional already, and we appreciate it. We're going to do a couple of things that we normally would not do, but you may or may not heard there's an election coming up. Just so you know that. And uh, I read a statistic. How about this number? 60 million evangelical Christians did not vote in the last election cycle. 60 million claimed to be born-again Christians did not vote. And so at this time, if I could get our men to help us, if you are not registered to vote, I want you uh, to receive one of these cards. If you are registered to vote, I want you to receive one of these cards. If you do not know you're registered to vote, receive one of those cards. Uh, everybody in the building, I'd like you to receive uh, one of these cards. And uh, quickly, gentlemen, if you'll just give one to everybody. And uh, by the end of the service, we want you to fill these out. We're going to collect them. This is what's called a voter registration drive. You say, well, I didn't come to church to get registered to vote. You're here. Shame on you. All right? Uh, but uh, we believe it's the, listen, it's the Christian's duty, the Christian's duty to be a good citizen. 
Uh, you study your Bible, and the Bible says that we're to render unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. And as good citizens, we want to be good citizens in voting. And uh, don't complain about our administration if you're not doing something to alter that. And uh, let's support good men, good women who have a conservative stand, uh, a biblical moral view. And uh, you don't worry about the finances. Let God worry about that. I can't change your finances just like I can't change this weather, but I know somebody who can. And so we'll worry about God and His blessing and let others worry about that. So, fellas, if you'll get those passed out and then be seated. Uh, I'm honored today. And again, uh, I was just up at the Pinellas County Jail this week. I was there for a good reason. I was not there for the reason many of you were there. But uh, I, I, uh, I made a statement as I left the jail. The only difference between being in this jail and being at my church is you ain't got caught yet. But... Uh, I was up at the jail this week, and I got to talk to so many of our officers there, and I was meeting a couple of our guys that had stumbled along the way and just trying to pray with them and encourage them. And thankfully, many of them seem to be uh, learning from past mistakes. But I recognized uh, the service of our local law enforcement. Last year, we had the privilege in this service to recognize uh, Miss Yaslowitz, and of course, her husband had given his life just prior uh, to our service in uh, defending Pinellas County and St. Petersburg. And, and of course, uh, we've had some tragedies here the last few years. And uh, many times I see a policeman, you see a policeman, our first response is to worry about our speed or if we're buckled up or whatever our issue is. But, uh, you know, these guys, they never know when they're going to pull over a preacher or an armed convict. And uh, so you never know what day they've been having already. And uh, so we thought it would be interesting today to meet uh, the sheriff and ask him to come. And I'd like to turn your attention to the video screen and uh, as we introduce our sheriff here in Pinellas County, and then we're going to ask him to come have a word of greeting for us. Sarah? I'm Sheriff Bob Gualtieri, and I have the honor of leading the 2,700 men and women of the sheriff's office who patrol and protect your neighborhood. Through their hard work and dedication, crime is down 12%. Arrests are up 28% and we lead the nation with 100% homicide closure rate. All this while reducing our budget by $108 million. My job provides serious, sober leadership 24-7 to keep Pinellas County safe and provide the highest level of service for your tax dollar. Please join Community Bible Baptist Church as we welcome Pinellas County Sheriff Bob Galtieri. Well, thank you, Pastor, and thanks to everybody for inviting us here today just to say a few words and to recognize the heroes uh, in our community who are the military, who are the first responders, and that includes law enforcement, EMS, fire personnel, and as the Pastor said, those people who are rushing into those burning buildings and crumbling buildings <clears throat> as others are rushing out. I think that 9-11 uh, uh, was a game changer for our nation. Uh, it's definitely a defining moment in our nation. And in so many respects, uh, it uh, defined what was wrong and the horrific motives of those people who wanted to take down our country. But at the same time, and the things that we want to focus on, the things we need to focus on, is, is that what it represents, what's right about our country and what's right about the people. And I'm a very strong believer, and I'm sure most of you are, if not all of you, in American exceptionalism. And it is a great country. And we're not perfect, and none of us are, but we try every single day. And I know the first responders, the police, fire, and EMS uh, do that every day. Come to work and try and make a difference in our lives, try and make a difference in our community. If we look at the uh, bios of those people who perished in 911, uh, we see people from all walks of life, we see people with all backgrounds, but we see so much of what defines what's good and what's right about our country, what's right about America. And one of the things that uh, is a real uh, tribute to them 
And it is the fact that we have not forgotten, we cannot forget, and we will not forget as we move forward. And this service is an example of that. And what's going to occur over the next couple of days as we lead up to the 11th anniversary of 9-11 is, is that this will go on forever. And it has to go on forever because we have to send a message to those who don't like what we stand for that we are not going to tolerate what happened on 9-11 ever again. And it is a changing moment. It is a defining moment. Some of it's not so good uh, when you go to the airport now you all but got to get undressed to go through those security lines. But that's a good thing because it means that we're safe and we had to change and we had to change the ways. From a law enforcement perspective, it changed us. It redefined what we do and how we do it. And we have a lot more acronyms now. We have urban area security initiatives and we have regional domestic task forces, but we are all working better together. We're working more closely, and we're working to make sure that the community stays safe. As the video that you just saw said, is that we are safe here in Pinellas County. And in the Sheriff's Office, we have 2,700 employees of the Sheriff's Office. And it's not because of me. It has little to do with me. It has all to do with them. And they come to work every single day as dedicated professionals. And crime is down 12% in our service area over the last three years. And for the first six months of this year, it's down another 8%. Arrests are up by 28%. We have 100% case closure in our homicides. Again, that not, nothing to do with me. It has to do with them and all of those professionals who are at work every single day. When we go to bed at 11 o'clock at night, a lot of them are going to work. And they're out there all night keeping our community safe. And that's what it's all about. And they live for it because they find meaning in their lives, as you do in all of your careers. Uh, and they really are great people who are doing a lot. And, and I certainly, on behalf of all of the men and women of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, all of the law enforcement community in Pinellas County, the first responders in Pinellas County, I thank you very much for recognizing uh, all of their efforts here today and through the celebrations that are going to occur in the next couple of days. And I appreciate the opportunity to come out and say a few words to you this morning and look forward to the rest of the service. Thank you. I remember. I remember when I was in Texas pastoring and I was watching one of those late night police shows. And I remember watching there was a murder and there was an investigation. And, and I remember thinking, I never would want to live in that town, Pinellas Park, Florida. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so just a few years later, I came. But I appreciate. Uh, and we have men in our church that serve in our law enforcement. And we have men and, and women that just do a great job in getting to meet these guys and uh, just uh, realize that, you know what, they're normal people who have a very difficult job. And uh, you pray for them and uh, you support them. And when you do get a ticket, be nice to them because if you didn't really deserve it that time, you deserved it the time before you didn't get caught, all right? And uh, we thank the Lord for a sheriff. And we're praying for you and uh, praying for our, our guys that serve with you. Uh, we always invite special guests, and uh, we thank the Lord for all of you who come. And uh, we, we, don't, we, we have a Veterans Day, and we have Memorial Day, and we have all these other. But for our church family, this is the, the big day of the year as far as for our citizens, our country. And uh, we're just thankful. If you are one of our special guests, if you're not a member of Community Bible Baptist Church, but you are a member of the first responder corps, whether you're a fireman or a policeman, an emergency technician, you're anything to do uh, with a nurse or a doctor or anything that helps people in that regard, uh, we're thankful you're here. If you're part of our military, uh, if you're currently serving active duty, maybe you're guard or reservist, but uh, you're ready to be called up if uh, you're called upon, we thank you for being here. And then there's a bunch of you here that have served in the past, and we're honored that you're with us as well. At this time, we'd like to recognize uh, all of those who serve. And our church family uh, just appreciates that. Before we recognize those individuals, if this is your first time and you're a guest with us, or maybe uh, you've been here before, but you're not a member of our church family, would you do me a favor and let us have a record of your visit? Uh, if you would just slip your hand up. That, that's all of our first responders, all of our honored guests. Now you say, Pastor, I don't like filling out cards. I don't want to be on a mailing list. I'm giving away that gas grill in the back. All right? <laughs> the way to win that grill is fill this card out. So I, whether you want to or not, if you want the gas grill, fill the card out, all right? 
Uh, but uh, we're, we just want to, listen, the main thing, we're not going to bother you. Our church is not one of those churches that's going to bother you. But we do want to have a record of your visit. We want you to be uh, aware of what's going on here at Community. And uh, all of our guests, whether you're military, whether you're a friend or what have you, you're here today. We're honored you're here. And so we want to honor you by giving you a chance to win uh, that grill. Thank you, fellas. Is that about everybody? Is everybody filling out at the end of service, we'll collect it. Now, if you are one of those first responders, doctors, nurses, police, fire, military, active duty, uh, or reserve guard, would you stand to your feet? And our church family wants to say thank you. If you're a guest today in one of those areas, would you stand, please, right now all over the building? Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Our guys have a gift for you. Remain standing just a moment. Just a moment. Let our guys get to you. Now, so many of you have served. Fellows down front, there's a ton down here. Thank you so much. If you raise your hand, these, right, these guys, they're good, but they're a little slow. Amen. What a blessing. <laughs> Becca and John, did you get something, John? Did you get your gift? Fellas, get on the ball back there. Thank you so much. All right. It, it's, it's a privilege. Now, uh, we have more. If you don't get a gift right now, we're going we're gonna to make sure you get something uh, before we leave. But uh, we are so thankful for all of our folks uh, that have joined us today. And uh, it's an honor. Let me just recognize a few folks. Uh, you're going to meet some of these in just a moment. Of course, you've already met the sheriff. And again, honored you're here. You're going to meet uh, Lieutenant Picard and Party Girl. Uh, you're going to meet them in just a moment. Sergeant McKenzie. You're going to meet Mac in just a moment. Uh, Miss Bosta, where are you at? There she is. Going to meet her in just a moment. And uh, other guests, we're so thankful. Going to meet Miss Miles in just a moment. Uh, this is my friend Chris and Chris Janae. If you don't know, know that I love these folks very much, and uh, they're the best Catholic Baptist I know of right there. Amen. And uh, we're so thankful for them. They don't attend our church, but they ought to, praise God. And uh, Gail Stark, Gail is with the Salvation Army, and we're so thankful she's with us today. And uh, Lord willing, uh, Major Gillum is going to be o coming over after his service and uh, join us as well. Uh, and then my friend Glenn. Glenn, where are you? Would you stand, Glenn? And uh, let me introduce you to Glenn. Uh, he is running for our local uh, city, uh, not city council, but school board. He is sitting on the school board now, and he was a government appoint, uh, governor appointed member, and now running for re-election, and I've spoken to him about his view of education. Listen, we need men like this on our school boards to lead us the right direction. And Glenn, we're honored that you're here. And uh, I want you to go by and meet him and let him explain a little bit about some of his ideas about not just uh, uh, giving them something in the school, but something following up as well. And Glenn, so thankful you're here and uh, just an honor that you're with us today. And then other guests, we're, we're, we're so thankful each of you are here. And uh, last year we had the privilege to honor uh, Sergeant Friedland. So good to have you back. And he was stabbed in the line of duty at the, our school here up north. And uh, just uh, such a good fella, good Christian, loves the Lord. And uh, right back to work, right back to work. And uh, so we're so appreciative. Any other of our honored guests that I miss, we're so thankful you're here. And uh, Rebecca, we're going to meet her in just a moment. John, so glad to have you. And uh, just uh, so many, many folks that uh, we're thankful that you're with us today. Uh, it is a privilege. Uh, we invite uh, all of our elected officials. And by the way, we invite all of our elected officials regardless of their uh, affiliation party-wise. And uh, many of them have come who don't agree with us, and we're, we're honored they're with us. They, this is not about uh, fighting or arguing, but uh, we're so thankful when people do respond. And I got a sweet letter from a lady that would not believe as we do, and uh, she explained that she just couldn't make it. But, boy, uh, what a kind letter. And so uh, we've learned to disagree without becoming disagreeable. And uh, so we thank the Lord. But at this time, I would like a uh, representative from Congressman Bill Young's office to come, and uh, this is uh, Miss uh, Shirley Mialis, and the congressman could not come this morning, but Shirley's here on his behalf, and she'd like to read something here, and in just a few moments, the congressman also has a presentation for our award winner. Shirley? Thank you, Pastor Stansel. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be here representing Congressman Young in God's house to honor our heroes. When 9-11th anniversary came last year, Congressman Young read something into the congressional record, and I would like to read it to you. Today, we remember the tragic events of September the 11th, 20, 
2001. As we honor those who lost their lives, my prayers remain with the friends and families of those victims. I continue to be humbled by the acts of bravery and selfless Ex selflessness exhibited by the American people that day, as well as in the years since. While the lives of each and every American citizen is forever changed, we have shown that the foundation of our great nation is strong, and we remain committed to maintaining our freedom. I would also like to say from Congressman Young, thank you to our EMT, our paramedics, our firefighters, our active duty military, our veterans, this congregation, the volunteers and all medical personnel who came and stepped forward to help all of us to have the freedoms that we have today. God bless this congregation. God bless all of them. And God bless the United States of America. Thank, Thank you to all of you. It is uh, something that we do at our church family to try to teach our children to respect our country, to respect our public servants. And uh, we want them to come at this time. And uh, our young people, we have a very active children's ministry here. Of course, with children, all ministry is active. But uh, we have a, uh, uh, a bunch of young people that want to sing. And uh, we do our best around here to try to teach them biblical values, biblical structure. And uh, by the way, God ordained our government. And so we let them know that. And uh, we're so thankful. This is part of our young people's department. And uh, Pastor Courtright is our children's pastor. And uh, they're going to sing for you at this time. And so you listen as the young people sing. Amen. Thank you, guys. Love you. And uh, what a blessing. We have a uh, special uh, love for our own church family when they go to serve our country. And this time we have Lance Corporal uh, Rebecca Quintana to come. And uh, she has a presentation for our church family. Rebecca. United States Marine Corps. This certifies that the accompanying United States flag was flown over Camp Leatherneck amid the battlefields of Afghanistan during decisive operations against enemy forces in Hemland Providence on the 20th of May, 2012. Lance Corporal Rebecca A. Quintana, United States Marine Corps, dedicated this flag to Community Bible Baptist Church. Hey. Okay, let's step to your left a little. Rebecca just returned from Afghanistan. She's now stationed at Camp Pendleton in California. And uh, we're so honored also to have her husband Rob here. And Rob is also in the Corps as well, correct? Navy. Navy. We'll forgive you for that. Amen. <laughs> 
I'm sick of you airmen. Uh, I'm sick of you guys picking on us airmen, so whatever, amen. But uh, Manny, I didn't see you over there. So good to have the Attorney General at McDill Air Force Base here. Uh, not Attorney General. Inspector General. I got you confused. Inspector General, good to see you, Manny. And uh, what a privilege to have you as well. But uh, Rob and Rebecca are here from California. And uh, John is here. This is uh, David and Lori Hall's son-in-law. I'm so glad to have him in and his wife, Jacqueline. And she's uh, going to have David and Lori's grandchild. So they care nothing else about Jacqueline any longer <laughs> as long as the grandchild is okay, okay? Uh, every year we, we, we pick, and I always get with Chris and, and some others that I count on for, for wisdom and guidance. But we want to pick some folks to, to honor uh, and let you know that there are some good people trying to hold conservative values in our local government, our state government, and our national government. And uh, it, it gets a little hard sometimes. Uh, uh, years ago in Texas, I, I picked a guy, and we're going to honor him, and we gave him his award. week later, he voted himself an 18% raise. And uh, so we, we have to be careful sometimes. But uh, every year we honor three distinct offices or branches that we want to recognize. And the first that we're going to do this year is our public servant of the year. Uh, please turn your attention to the screen. Sarah? Hi, my name is Nancy Bostock, and it has been an honor and privilege to serve you these past four years as your representative to the Pinellas County Commission. Returning me to the County Commission ensures that you will have a voice at the Commission table on fighting to keep your taxes low, fighting to ensure that we spend your tax dollars in the most effective and efficient manner possible on those community services that are most important to you. And it will ensure that we continue to strive to have the most accountable and transparent government for you possible. Please join Community Bible Baptist Church as we welcome County Commissioner Nancy Bostock. Nancy, thank you for coming. I'm going to take a picture right there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Wow, I wasn't expecting that video. How, how nice, how nice. Um, I just want to thank uh, Pastor Sansel, Chris Janae, everybody involved with putting this event together today. Um, what a great church. What a great um, honor it is to be recognized in this way. Um, I'd like to ask you all to uh, welcome um, my family here today and um, join me in, in a quick praise for my mom, Judy Haynes. If you could wave there. Um, you, you would never know it, but six weeks ago she was in severely declining health, n uh, no medical answers around. We finally found the right doctors. Less than six, six weeks ago she underwent brain surgery, and this is her first major outing since, and she's doing great. Um, if you would have asked her six weeks ago, she would have never guessed she was sit would be sitting here or sitting anywhere. Um, I'm pl uh, pleased that my daughter Sarah Bostock is able to join us today also. And my husband is um, very sorry that he wasn't able to join you today, but he left at ooh, like 5 a.m. this morning on orders for his um, annual Navy uh, Reserve duty. So that's uh, why he's not here, but he also appreciates your recognition for our heroes. Um, I was honored to attend this event last year and was so impressed with your, with your uh, community here and had no idea that I'd be up here receiving this recognition this year. And I just want to thank you for including your local elected officials. Glenn will tell you that um, local elected officials don't always receive a lot of recognition, um, and um, especially on the school board. And so thank you, Glenn, for what you're doing. Um, um, and, and to be included um, with, with the frontline public servants, our, our heroes, our, our, our um, first responders, our, our, our servicemen and women is, is such an honor because my job does not entail nearly the amount of, of risk and self-sacrifice that these brave men and women give to our community. My job primarily is to work with the commission to make the decisions about your local government that enable them to do their jobs. And along those lines, I appreciate the service today. I would like to encourage you to continue your involvement in the community because your elected officials need your input so that we will continue to make those decisions that support these men and women. Um, sometimes it's fun to spend money on what I like to call the project of the week. Um, 
but that's not always what's in, in the best interest. We need to uh, make sure that, that uh, these folks have what they need to do their jobs because their jobs are taking care of us. And it's a, it's a very nice circle there. And so um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the recognition. But keep on your elected officials. We need your support, but we also need your input and your accountability. Thank you very much for t including me today. Thank you, sir. Shirley has uh, also the congressman's uh, gift. Let's make sure we get the right one. There we go. There we go. All right, Shirley. All right, thank you. Good morning again to everyone. Congressman Young, when he heard what was happening, and he's known Pam for a very long time, and he respects her and what she does for our county, he wanted to have a flag flown over the Capitol in Washington in honor of her receiving this, and I'd like to read what it says, and there's a flag flowing over the Capitol. At the request of the Honorable C.W. Bill Young, member of Congress, this flag was flown for Pinellas County Commissioner Nancy Bostock in recognition of her years of service and on receiving the Public Servant of the Year Award during ceremonies at the third annual Honor Our Heroes Service at Community Baptist Bible Church on September the 9th, 2012 in St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. There's your flag. There's your award. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, that's very kind of the congressman. We appreciate that. Uh, every year we look, uh, the last few years, unfortunately, it's not been hard to find uh, a law enforcement or first responder who's gone above and beyond because, unfortunately, uh, we here in Tampa and St. Pete have had some, uh, some real tragedies. Uh, this year we were asking a few folks, and because of scheduling, and then because of our church's connection with the country of Haiti and our mission work there, rebuilding churches and schools, uh, we just found a fit that we thought was a neat thing. And so I'd like you to turn your attention to the screen as we meet our first responder of the year. Most dogs at the Purina Incredible Dog Challenge come for the sport, the fun, and most of all, to share the joy and love they have with their owners. At the Eastern Regional Championships in St. Petersburg, the Tampa Fire and Rescue Dogs came out to show how they use the same type of skill set showcased at the PIDC to save lives in Florida and, most recently, how they made a trip to Haiti, using their skills to find victims buried in the rubble. The canine program is a specialty. Uh, it's something that there's a select number of people that have a desire and have a love for the dogs that are in this program. Generally, a dog will run across a grassy field all day long, but when you put very unpleasant surfaces under their feet or areas of elevation and things that move and crackle or tunnels and dark spaces, that's not for every dog. And a good search dog has to do that without question. And that's what we've taught them to do there. And then when it comes to the real world, when we actually go to those disaster scenarios, it's nothing to send a dog inside of a crawl space and say, go search. Then it was quickly, they quickly realized that the magnitude of the earthquake was big, so more help was needed. I gotta tell you, I went with some of the best men and women I've ever met. 80 of us came together, but as a search dog handler, when you step off that bus, I can tell you that the crowds get quiet, the spirits of the rescuers lift up, because they have seen us work, they have seen the job that these search dogs can do, and, and you can't replace them. When we, when we first got there, they sent us out on our first search, which was a which was a school that there was reported to be about 150 to 200 people in this, in this collapse. We called out and we heard the voice of a seven-year-old girl. I turned to the rescuer next to me and I told him, I said, and I got chills just thinking about it, that that is the voice of an angel. I knew that the 13 years of training had all come together and that now it was our turn to put that together and rescue that gal. You know, when those buildings come down, it happens like that. Nobody has a chance to run out. That's exactly where the search dogs excel. 
But when I watched those dogs work at the World Trade Center, at Hurricane Katrina, and then recently in Haiti, I noticed something different in the dogs. It wasn't a game anymore. It wasn't we were playing to have fun. Um, when you ask me from my heart, do I really believe that they understand that we're looking for people now, that this, this is the last chance for that person trapped underneath this debris? I'll tell you, yes. I've been a search dog handler, and I've seen them work. There's something different. There's, there's an urgency in, there, in them. Maybe it's that they sense it from us as the rescuers, but they know that they have a gift to offer, and, and if they do their job well, we'll find somebody alive. The dogs go to work with us, they go home with us, they go everywhere with us. Uh, that bond with that dog is uh, it's, 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 it's quite different. And we know that they do something special, so every time I go out, I mean, I walk proudly with this dog. I'll put the badge on her. I want to tell everybody about the job that we do. It's just a privilege that, that I'll hold my head up and carry that leash as long as I can. Please join Community Bible Baptist Church as we welcome Tampa Firefighter, Lieutenant Roger Picard. So good to have you. Yes, sir. Oh, awesome. Come right here. Amen. How about that party? You want to sit down for a second? Thank you. I'm normally not a loss for words, but I got to tell you, you guys have touched my heart this morning. That was priceless. And pastor, parishioners, brother firefighters, EMS, law enforcement, and military, I shouldn't be standing here alone, I can tell you that. There should be a bunch of us up here because there's a great job that we do. And it is a privilege to come up here and say thank you for the honor that you're extending to me today. My partner, Party Girl, I meant every word of what I said up there. She's a fantastic search dog and a great privilege and honor to be out there when we represent uh, these agencies. People ask me all the time, they said, how does a firefighter from Tampa make it all the way to New York to participate in the World Trade Center events, to Haiti and others? I'm just like you. I specialized in something and I wanted to take that next step and I wanted to be the best of the best at it. And I hope that we've uh, held up your expectations of that. We spoke about the voice of an angel in Haiti and I've got to tell you a short story about that. We actually went out at night. I was the fifth member of the team, so I wasn't scheduled to go out unless somebody got injured or they had an extra event. About nine o'clock at night in Haiti, they said, we have a secret mission for you. And those of us in uniform know what these secret missions end up being sometimes. So we went out to the Caribbean market. It was a, a market that the local community had five stories tall. Everybody was in there shopping and it had fallen. And we uh, searched that evening with a group from Turkey, and they were exhausted. They had no water, they had no food, they had heard voices. So we asked them, there was just a small handful of us, five or six of us, we asked them to be quiet. We went into the basement. I grew up in California, so I know what earthquakes were and, er and aftershocks. And I looked up at a small hole in the ceiling and I said, this is not where I should be, but we're gonna do it. And then we called out, and we continued to call out and we heard the voices. My heart was pounding. The hair on the back of my neck went up and I said, they're right, it's the truth. So we asked the questions that first responders ask. How many of there are you? And they said, six of us. There's several women and one man. We got excited, we grabbed the radio, called for reinforcements. We then ran up onto the roof, stood there and said, well, let's call down and see if we can get any closer. Let's narrow the search area down. Standing next to me was several women and one man. And when I called out, they all responded. And then I began to realize, oops, we were talking to the folks on the roof. My heart dropped because I had honestly thought that we had found people that we had come hours and hours from Miami to travel there to rescue. And that's when we asked them to be quiet again because they insisted that over 20 hours they heard voices and they heard voices. So they did, they were quiet. And we heard the voice, the voice of an angel. 40 hours later, men and women on their hands and knees with buckets and shovels were able to rescue that seven-year-old girl. She told us about others that were in that building too. And at the end of the three-day operation, five people were rescued alive from that building. The sixth one did not make it, sadly. 
At the end of our 12-day deployment, the federal teams all came together. There wasn't much smiling. There wasn't much backslapping. We had done a good job. 45 people had been saved. Amen. 45 people that never would have been saved had the United States not put together the finest men and women of elite search and rescue teams, flown them to Haiti, put them under adverse conditions, and said, go do what we taught you to do. And it worked out well. So, I must thank you from the local first responders, law enforcement, and military. It's a privilege to do what we do, and we'll be there again if you call us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, good morning to everyone, and Congressman Young wanted to have a flag also flown and to honor what he did and what all the first responders do. At the request of the Honorable C.W. Bill Young, member of Congress, this flag was flown for first responder Lieutenant Roger Picard in recognition of his search and rescue efforts in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, rescuing multiple victims presented during the third annual Honor Our Heroes service at Community Baptist Church on September the 9th, 2011 in St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you so much. The dog's name, if you didn't get it, is Party Girl. <laughs> She's obviously not Baptist. <laughs> My wife grew up in Haiti, and uh, she spent 11 years of her life there. And so the effects, uh, the aftershocks of that earthquake uh, caused our church to get a burden to want to go help. And uh, there's about 30 men and uh, ladies in this crowd that went down there and rebuilt a, or a school, uh, worked in an orphanage, and just to understand your heart to help those people. And so we're honored uh, that you're here. Uh, our last award winner this year is uh, just a neat story how that the Lord in the last just few days leading up to preparation uh, put all this together. And, uh, you know, it's one thing, and we've done this for so many years, we've honored so many uh, that gave their life, and so we have to honor their family. Uh, but this year we have an award winner who is with us today, and that makes it so uh, much easier on us, and we're so grateful. But the price that he paid for serving our country I'd like you to turn your attention to the screen and see that. As a boy, Christian McKenzie always wanted to fly. He had planned to join the military after high school, but love led him to his future wife, Jennifer. She and his baby daughter changed his plans. But knowing that he still longed for the sky, Jennifer encouraged him to reach for his boyhood dream. And in 1991, he earned his wings with the Air Force. For 10 years, life was good for McKenzie. He'd found his dream job as a special operations flight engineer aboard an MH-53 Pavlo helicopter, flying low-level, long-range, undetected flights into enemy territory day or night and in all kinds of weather to insert, extract, and resupply special operation forces. Master Sergeant McKenzie racked up 2,300 hours of flight time, including 500 hours in combat. On April 13, 2004, McKenzie's Pablo went on a night mission to deliver supplies to a team in Fallujah, a desert city crawling with armed insurgents. They were about 180 feet off the ground when an insurgent stood up about 300 feet in front of them and fired an RPG straight into the nose of the helicopter. A few moments later, another RPG hit the helicopter, bringing it to the ground. McKenzie was rescued and rushed to a nearby medical facility where he was treated for severe facial trauma, traumatic brain injury, and the destruction of one eye. He spent 16 months in and out of hospitals, numerous surgeries, and painful rehabilitation. In July of 2005, a medical board approved McKenzie's request to remain on active duty. 
In August, he returned to flying status and reassigned to Andrews Air Force Base to work as a flight attendant. Please join Community Bible Baptist Church as we honor highly decorated Master Sergeant Christian McKenzie. Awesome, man. God bless you, brother. I have to say that this is uh, quite an honor when. Uh, Colonel Maldonado came up to me. My job actually now at SOCOM headquarters is to find people to attend these events on behalf of our wounded, ill, and injured, especially for those of you sitting right here in this church. That is the reason we do this. I'm going to break from what I was going to say a little bit because the picture that's on the video screen right now, um, in the lower left corner, that's, that's my crew in Afghanistan on my first tour in a remote located base. And I, I sent these pictures home. Uh, this is 1991, and uh, my younger brother, who was at uh, Oral Roberts University, began to search and find a way to, on print, show his absolute honor and respect for the military that's out there that does this job, not only in the past, but currently, and as we always will in the future. And so he put this together himself for September 11th, 2002. And, uh, it's quite an honor to, not only because it's my little brother, but uh, because I'm actually in his creation and, and, his, and his things. But that very same little brother, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's quite an honor as a big brother. I mean, he's 12 years younger than I am, and he wanted to follow in my footsteps. And we always talked about me, uh, you know, welcoming him into the military and pinning on that first rank. And of course, I was a, uh, you know, dirt-eating, low-level enlisted guy, so I always encouraged him to be an officer, and I was going to get him up there. And, I was going to pin them Lieutenant Bars on them and just uh, completed it being in Kosovo and Bosnia. And we were doing that event in 1999 as we were, you know, rescuing down pilots and doing what we do best and going into places that uh, no one in their right mind would go to and do things that nobody would think could be done. And I was coming home back to the States and it started for some reason just started to occur to me, you know, all the things I want to do when I get home, you know, I want to go to Burger King and get me a Whopper and, you know, go to Taco Bell and get me a taco, and, yeah, man. you know, and, you know, the, the, the folks on the roller skates at Sonic that's going to bring out my big old sloppy burger and, and you know, for, Route 44 soda. <laughs> and I talked to my little brother and I said, you know, I said, because he was so successful, just everything he touched, he was successful in. And I told him, this is right before he was heading off to Elwood Roberts University. And I told him, I said, I said, Joseph, I said, you know what? I said, you got to do what's in your heart and you got to do what makes you happy because somebody has to be here doing what they do best in order to make it worth it for me and my friends to go do what we do best. Because we don't have a country as great as America. There's no reason for us to go do what we do. So. You know, I got to give the announcer a little bit of credit. He really tried, but that's actually pronounced Pavlo, not Pavlo, but that's okay. <laughs> it's a beautiful machine that uh, just did amazing things. And, you know, that, that night was just like many others, you know, and, and we, just, we just go, you know. We get called, we go. That's what we do. And it's an honor to do it. You know, I remember September 12th, 2000, 2001. We were overhead of the World Trade Center, ground zero, just yearning to reach down and help. But we had the FEMA guys, and we had a responsibility to do what we do, and we knew that they were there. And then we left. And if you've ever seen the line drawing, it's just a pencil drawing. And it's of a group of firemen on a pile of rubble, handing that flag to a soldier. And as we say to you, we'll take it from there. And that's what we did. We pressed out and we did it and we did it and we did it and, you know, every day my mom prayed and her church prayed and I just kept going and just kept going and just kept going and it was, it was honorable to see the changes we were making. It was honorable to see the things that we were doing. 
And at times, our efforts were what got these guys home. So, you know, that night, that was one of them honorable missions. And I had no anticipation whatsoever what was going to happen that night. And we had everything on our favor. It was dark. It was ugly out. Sand was blowing. You know, who in their right mind at 2 o'clock in the morning is going to be flying a helicopter? And it all changed. You know, but minute after minute, if, you, if I go through the whole story, you'll see that minute after minute, somebody was there. Somebody just like me was there for me. And one thing led to another, led to another, and I'm in the hospital and where the picture with me and General Jumper was taken. And time after time, experts, people that flew this bird with me, that had done tests on helicopters, had done all this stuff, and they kept saying, it's unsurvivable. You shouldn't be here. The fact that you're not dead, I mean, just on and on and on. And uh, my mom was just sitting there in the room with me, and you know, we got to talking, and she said, you know what, son? Obviously, there's something more for you to do. And, uh, and that's kind of how I live my life. I refuse to take a no for an answer. I refused to stop. Every time they said, you're not going to stay in the military. Eh, not going not to buy that. You're not going to fly again. Nope, not going to buy that. And uh, the end of December 2006, I'm up at Andrews just doing what I do. And uh, I got a phone call from an old flying buddy of mine who is now the squadron commander of, of uh, where I was part of the 20th SOS. And he said, Mac, one of our guys got shot. He's coming to Walter Reed. I need your help. You know, and I had, I had beat the medical board, and I had proven that a one-eyed guy could fly again. And I, had, I mean, I just, time after time, and I'm in this unit that needed my help. And, and I'm like, okay, I must be doing what I'm supposed to be here to do. And every time I reach that point, here it comes. Big change happening. So he flew in out of Germany, and, and I rolled in with everything I had and all the tools of everybody that had ever helped me and my family all the way through this process. And uh, all of a sudden, the Sergeant Major walks up to me, and he goes, Hey, Mac, you want to do this full time? And I thought, my God, how could I be more honorable than being a Pavlo helicopter flight engineer? But I was like, yes, I can. And I gave him a laundry list of why the Air Force wouldn't let me do this. You know, I hadn't even been a flight attendant for a year. I hadn't done anything for long enough to pay back what they'd cost to bring me up to the status where I was at. And I said, here you go. And I went back to work. Four months later, I'm getting ready to do a mission. And uh, lo and behold, here comes the superintendent going, hmm, I guess this is your final flight. Here's your orders. And I'm not a medical guy. I'm just a helicopter dude. But I was going to Walter Reed, and I was going to take care of the wounded ill injured coming back from off the battlefield. And uh, ever since that day, it's just been the most amazing time of my life, where I can to be there at the bedside in the worst time of trauma to take care of these folks and to look after them for you. Because these guys continue. You know, if you want to, if you want to really understand your military these days, there is not one man or woman serving in the United States military that's forced to be there. Every one of these people have volunteered to put that uniform on and on your behalf take care of business. This is a whole new time. And yet every one of these guys, as they come back, and I get to be there, and I watch them overcome, and I watch them recover, and I give them everything I got, and they just, they just go out and do amazing things. And the first thing they say is, I need to get my uniform back on and go. And they go, and they go, and they go. So. You know, when he brought the request to me and I started reaching out and looking for other folks and, and uh, you know, I just said, you know what? This is huge. For everything else that I've done and I've stood up and I put on my uniform for, I thought, wow, this is a small community church in the community in which I live. Absolutely, I'm going to be there. So, I mean, it's not just me. I'm a small piece, very, very small piece of the entire pie of those that are out there doing this job. But uh, on behalf of all of them, I just want to say thank you.
comforting other than that. We'll replace that. At the request of Honorable C.W. Bill Young, member of Congress, this flag was flown for Master Sergeant McKenzie in honor of his service to his nation and also to our country as a whole. And it was done on behalf of the third annual honoring our hero's service at the Community Baptist Church on September the 9th, 2012 in St. Petersburg, Florida. I would just like to add, Congressman and Mrs. Young go to Walter Reed Hospital uh, most every single week. Mrs. Young is there a lot of times. I have been there. And I can tell you the job that he has to do in helping those other people that have been injured is so huge. I cannot begin to tell all of you what heart it takes to have to do this and see your fellow comrades who have suffered and are still suffering there. But you know what? I was there. And you know what? They're the ones with the smiles on their faces. They're the one thanking God. They're the ones ready to serve their country, to get out of that bed and do what they need to do for others. They're not thinking of themselves. I saw it firsthand. And my boss, Congressman Young, and his wife see it every week. And if they can do anything to help any veteran, any service member, they're there for them. And it's from the bottom of their hearts that they love each and every one of them that serve. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Matt. God bless you, brother. All right. Uh, now that uh, Shirley has preached for us, we will have the invitation. <laughs> receive the offering and be dismissed. Um, I would like for a member of the post to come at this time. Uh, there is a tradition in the Navy for the ringing of the ship's bell. And uh, we have uh, these gentlemen here who obviously have served uh, in years past and in honor of those who have fallen the ringing of the ship's bell. Years ago, years ago, we found a song that uh, we've asked Clearwater Christian Ensemble to sing for us that best, in our opinion, tries to say thank you to these men and women. You listen as they sing.
Wonderful, wonderful. Just a moment, I'm not going to take long. Our church family has a tremendous meal prepared for all of our guests and uh, just a, a wonderful time of fellowship. And uh, we're so honored to have all of these, our special guests. Uh, but it is our church service. And so for the next few moments, would you take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 144. The book of Psalms, chapter 144. My notes say I have less than 20 minutes, but as always, that means nothing to me. But I promise just about 10 to 15 minutes, I want to share a thought the Lord gave me concerning this day. Uh, and uh, we were reminded two weeks ago as the Republican Party came to Tampa. And then again, we were reminded last week in Charlotte as the Democratic Party went there that everybody wants to make you happy. Uh, the Republicans say that if you will vote for me and put us in office, you'll be happy. And the Democrats say, if you will vote for me, you'll be happy. And the Libertarians say, don't vote for either one of them. Vote for us. You'll be happy. And the atheist and the agnostic and the uh, others say, vote for no one, have anarchy and chaos and all these other things. And, and so we live in a world where people are unhappy. They want to be happy, and everybody's telling them how to be happy. And uh, you find a lot of strange promises. By the way, uh, let me just uh, give you a little secret. Nobody can make you happy. Uh, there's no vote that's going to change your world. There's no elected official. Now, we certainly believe there is a more conservative line that would be better for us. Uh, but it really doesn't matter who runs the country or sits in the Oval Office. Uh, if you're not happy on the inside, there's no exterior thing that's going to make you happy. But the Bible makes a very interesting statement. God promises there is a way to be happy. Look at verse number 11, Psalms 144. Verse number 11, the Bible says, Rid me. Let's look at verse 10 first. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. That our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. That our garners may be full according all manner of store. That our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. That our oxen may be strong to labor. That there be no breaking in nor going out. And there be no complaining in our streets. Verse 15. Happy is that people that is such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Happy is that people... Uh, you know, there's a group of people that have figured something out. There is happiness. And by the way, the word happy in this context is the word for blessed. The word blessed. That means that you have favor, uh, that your life is worth living. There is a people in the world that is a happy people. And it's amazing to me, so many people are unhappy. They endure through life. Uh, literally, their life is one moment to the next. I've got to get a little something here, and then I've got to get a little something more. And they never find anything. They are always looking, and, and they say, well, I haven't found that thing. I'm not satisfied. I'm not fulfilled. And yet the Bible says, I'll tell you a secret. I'll tell you how to be happy. I'll tell you how to be a happy people. And I won't take time to preach this morning. It's a tremendous message as far as the ideas of it, the, the thoughts of it. But I, I want to give two parallels on a national level and then a very personal level. And I want to show you uh, four things just written in these few verses about how to be a happy people, how to be a blessed people. The first is found in verse number 10. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. In verse 11, you find an old English phrase in our Bible, strange children. What this really means, or how we would translate it, Brother Michael, is this is from foreigners, from those not like us, from those not with us, from those that are different from us. Now, before you get upset about a foreigner, if you're an American, you are at some point in your family history a foreigner. We all came from somewhere, uh, unless you're Native American, which I'm half Cherokee or part Cherokee, and so I own something somewhere, somewhere, way back there, but y'all took it. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> We're all from somewhere. 
And, and so it doesn't necessarily mean uh, nationality or uh, different culture or background. It, it means they're foreigners. They, they don't think like we do. They don't believe like we do. They don't act like we do. And, and there is a happy people, the Bible said, who is protected from foreigners, from those that would do us wrong, from those that would take what we think and what we feel and what we believe. And, and so a happy people is a protected people. It's an interesting phrase in verse number 11, the strange children, those who are foreigners, those who speak vanity, those who speak vanity, and those, uh, their right hands deliver falsehood. Uh, they, they are people that promise you one thing but deliver another. They're people of ulterior motives. Their, their goal is not your good. Their goal is actually to get from you, but now they'll tell you anything in order to get what they want. And so a happy person is a protected people. I do a lot of counseling, a lot of marriage counseling. You know what the number one need of a woman is in marriage? To feel secure, to feel protected. In fact, the man's first responsibility is to be that protector. By the way, on a national level, that's the role of government, to protect us, not to provide for our every need. The first principle of government is for our protection. And so a protected people on a national level, listen, let's stop worrying about what everybody wants and let's keep us from an enemy that would seek to change us or destroy us. But number two, on a personal level, you know why your life is such a mess all the time? Do, do, do you know why you're always looking for something you never find? There are some people that don't have your best interests at heart. There are some people that will sell you a bill of goods to get from you what they want, and they don't want any good for you at all. It's just the moment they can steal or the pleasure they can gain or the thing they can get. It's interesting to me. There is a world full of people that will listen to foreigners who don't have their best interests at heart but will ignore their parents, ignore their teachers, ignore their pastors, and people that have demonstrated time and time again that they want their protection, they want their best, they want them to go forward. My goal for my children is to go forward in life, not backward. And yet I have to convince my sons and my daughter that I care for more for them than the 14-year-old in class or the 19-year-old down the road or whatever it is. We, we are a desperate need for protection. Give me a protected people, I'll give you a happy person. But number two, notice this. The Bible says in verse number 12, a happy person is a person that is pro-family. Not only protected, but pro-family. Our sons, our sons be as plants grown up in their youth. Our daughters be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. They want two things for their children. They want their boys to be strong and their girls to be beautiful. Pro-family. Read an interesting statistic, Mac. One in 50 in Afghanistan, chance of being killed. One in 50. You go to Afghanistan, uh, Rebecca, you just got back from there. One in 50, chance of being killed. Chance of being killed in America in your mother's womb, one in three. Now, pro family. Listen, the cornerstone of our society is the family. As goes the family, goes the community. As goes the community, goes the nation. Destroy the family, you destroy the nation. I want my sons and daughters to be protected and to be blessed. I, this, this, these guys blow me away. Young man, you have a tremendous voice. Glad all those lessons I gave you paid off. <laughs> young lady, blonde young lady, I don't know. They're, wow. You know what I want for them? I don't know what God has, but I know this. I want more for them than they could imagine for themselves. I want a society, I want a place, I want a country where they're free to pursue their God-given dreams and let God's grace lead and guide them through life. And so that when they get to be 44 years old and they look at another group of young people behind them, they take what they've been given from their parents and their pastors and their society and give that to the next generation. I want more for my children than I had for myself, which was the goal of my father and his father before him. A happy people is a family people. By the way, statistically, and th these are numbers that I can't give you for sake of time, but statistically, married people with a family unit, they live longer, there are less health problems, there's less anxiety problems, there's less stress problems. Uh, you get things out of God's order, which is a father and a mother and children, uh, you get in a mess. 
pro-family, pro-sons and daughters. It's amazing to me that, that the opposition to conservatism would derail plans for a young girl wanting to have an abortion from seeing an ultrasound. Do you know why that is? Because once you see that baby in the womb, you would never murder it. But if you don't see it as a baby, if you see it as an it, you can take its life. Let me tell you, it's not an it. It's a life. It's a baby. At 18 days, its heartbeat is beating. So happy people is a pro-family people, children, Husbands, wives, loving together, laboring together. But number two, uh, not only do we see a productive people, uh, a protective people and a pro-family people, but a happy people. Look at verse 13. Our garners be full. Our sheep bringing forth thousands and ten thousands. Uh, our uh, oxen may be strong in labor, that there be no breaking in or going out. There be no complaining in the street. A happy people is a productive people, a hard-working people. A people with work ethic. Uh, By the way, in speaking about our children, I don't want to give my son this encouragement for life. Hey, son, do the best you can. Maybe somebody will give you a handout along the way. I want to tell my children, you work hard, you save money, you do the right thing, and you will succeed because you can do this with the grace of God and the help of God. Listen, you make it because you choose to, not because somebody makes it for you. Productive people. The Bible says much about work, and again, for the sake of time, we won't go there, but uh, the sluggard desireth and has nothing. Let me translate that. Lazy people don't have squat. Very new English, Sheriff. Lazy people, but the Bible says, Proverbs again, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. I'm a hard-working sucker, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, fat there is, a, is, 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 is to describe blessed, to, to describe those that have succeeded. Hey, how do you get ahead in life? Wait for somebody to hand out or go work for it yourself. Happy people. Listen, the Bible says again in Proverbs, there's, there's joy in labor. There, there's something about accomplishment Preacher, I'll labor when somebody gives me a job. Listen, you labor to get a job. Say, Preacher, I have a degree. Listen, I'm for you, and I understand times are hard. Don't get me wrong. Our church has suffered like every other church in our state has suffered. But I found this. People that want to work will find work. It may not be a title, but it it could be a job. It may not be a position. It may not be the career they want to stay in. But listen, they labor. And listen, if you don't have anything else to do, come to the church. I'll work your butt off. Won't pay you anything, but I'll work you hard. Amen. It's amazing, by the way, talking about just in our political rhetoric, giving and taking and who's the greedy and who's not. Do you know that most charitable giving in this country is done by Christians? Year after year after year, the greatest number of charitable giving, hospitals, orphanages, religious institutions, education. Charitable giving, the vast majority of it is done by religious people. St. Anthony, St. Mary's, hospitals, orphanages, schools. I was talking to Lieutenant Picard. If it wasn't for the faith-based agencies in Katrina, there would have been no relief for months and months and months because it took that long for the government to mobilize. Congressman Ted Poe, who's a dear friend of mine, said if it wasn't for churches and faith-based organizations, our counties would not have survived. Work. Happy is a man that works. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. But let me give you the fourth thing and I'll close. A happy people is a protected people. A happy people uh, is pro-family. By the way, I thought two things Sergeant, uh, uh, Master Sergeant uh, Mac, uh, McKenzie and Sergeant, uh, Lieutenant Picard, I thought two things. You know, we're told so much that America is uh, an imperialist place. We go to, to places to try to take over. Uh, I'm seeing stories of going to places to try to save lives and rebuild, not make kingdoms. Our military is a great source for good in this world. Now, if people mess with us, they ought to know that we have a strong ability to not let that happen. But when we're not at war, do you realize that our war, our war machine, our military, do you know what a force for good they are to help in tragedy and, and in trouble around this land? 
We're a protected people. We're a pro-family people. We're a productive people. But look at verse 15, and this is our text, and I'll give you just a moment and we'll be done. Blessed or happy is that people that in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. <laughs> happy. Brother Stan, so I don't believe in God. Well, okay, have a great day. God bless you. Now, it doesn't matter. That's the one thing about our Christianity versus the world's religion. We don't force you to join with us. Just let me explain this to you. I know where I'm going. I know why I'm here. I have a wonderful journey along the way. And, and, and I wake up every day with a zeal and a zest for, for loving my family and loving the Lord and loving our people. You say, Brother Cecil, you live in a fantasy world. You live in a dream world. Fine, don't wake me up. <laughs> you live in your sad, miserable life to where when you die, you have no idea what comes after. You have no idea where you'll go or who you'll meet. I can tell you all those things because the Bible tells you three things you need to know. Number one, it tells you how you got here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That explains evolution. It explains why you're here because man was put on this earth to bring honor and glory to God with everything we do. And then it tells you where you're going. It is appointed a man once to die and after this the judgment. For those that reject Christ is a literal place, Luke 16. And in hell the rich man died and lifted up his eyes. Lazarus also died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. So I know why I'm here. I know how I got here. And thank God I know where I'm going. That's basically life. That's basically the big three questions of life. How did I get here? Well, I'm an amoeba. I'm a, I'm a slug that fell out of the ocean. No, I'm formed in the image and likeness of a perfect God with the ability to choose between right and wrong, a moral compass separating me from all other creation. I have a moral compass to choose between right and wrong. That's how I got here. God created. And, and the Bible says, uh, uh, looking at creation, you can see the hand of a creator. Number two, I know what my purpose is. You say, well, Brother Sasso, your purpose is, is to preach. But in 1987 and 1990, my purpose was to put fuel in helicopters so people like that could go and do rescue missions. You say, well, you didn't have the cool job. I know I had a bad recruiter. <laughs> if I'd known I could have done that, man, I would have never been in POL. All we did was put gas in planes and get gassed ourselves. Well, that's not a cool thing. That's not a glamorous thing. No, but that was my job so that others could do their job, so that others could do their job. It doesn't matter your job. Your job is to glorify God. So you're, if, if you're in the jail and you're having to deal with that element, do that for the glory of God. And if you're a street sweeper, do it for the glory of God. If you're a lawyer, do that for the... Uh, anyway, uh, if, you're, if you're a doctor, uh, if you're a policeman, if you're whatever, your, your job doesn't matter. It's why you do your job. That's why you can be excellent, because you're doing it not for a paycheck or an employer, but for the glory of an almighty God who put you in that place to make a difference in somebody's life. And you may not get an award like Mac has or Lieutenant Picard has or Miss Bostock has, but you're doing a great work. Happy people is a people that knows God. I know I'm saved. I know that if I die today, and I'm not looking forward to that day, but Last year, I was sitting in my office, and I got a phone call. Actually, it was a text message. Across town is a Pentecostal preacher friend of mine. He's about 38, 39, and we'd meet together and have coffee every two or three weeks. And, and it was neat because his Pentecostal friends and my Baptist friends never met each other. But we would get together, and we'd just talk. And he'd talk about struggles in his family and struggles in the church. And I'd talk about our family and our church. And we just loved each other in the Lord. And and Tim became a, a really good friend of mine. And I got a text message. And he said, hey, Brent, he said, I'd like to ask your church. And by the way, he came to some of our concerts and, and, and he came to some of our events. And, and he said, I'd like to ask your church to pray for me. I, I felt a little bad, so I've gone to the doctor. And, and the doctor tells me that I've got to have some heart work done. Not a big deal. I'm going to go in Monday and, and they want me to rest for the weekend and, and just pray for me. And man, I sent a text back and I said, Tim, uh, I'll pray for you. But what time and what hospital? I'll meet you over there Monday and, and I'll sit with your wife and sit with your little daughter. And, and I'll be there for you. I love you, man, praying for you. And he said, I really appreciate that that was about 3 30 4 o'clock in the afternoon the next morning I was on my way into the church Saturday morning I was a Friday Saturday morning I was on my way into the church I got a call from a young lady I didn't recognize but she was calling on Tim's phone I thought it was Tim I said hey man how you doing he said she said pastor this isn't Tim 
She said, this is his assistant, and she told me her name. She said, Pastor, Tim laid down last night about 4.30, 5 o'clock. By the way, that's just a few moments after he texted me to pray for him that he was going to go in for surgery on Monday. He's going to rest the weekend and get, get ready for surgery. He, she said, Pastor, he laid down and took a nap, and Pastor, while he slept, he slept out into eternity. Tim's 38 years old. Went to the funeral. Wife, little girl. Listen, I, I don't know when life's coming. Mac never thought, he, he flew hundreds of missions. He never thought the, an insurgent would, would shoot an RPG in his helicopter. It always happened to the helicopter across the way. But that night it came to his helicopter. And you've seen thousands and thousands of lives change in great tragedies. You never know when your day's coming. But I can give you a little bit, it's coming. <laughs> Hilarious this morning. Old people say funny things. As a pastor, I know more about your bodily functions than I never need to know about. <laughs> this morning, Orville comes into my office and he says, now Orville is 90 years old. And Orville says, Pastor, my sister passed away last week. Would you just to pray for our family? And I said, oh, Orville, was she sick? He said, well, Pastor, she's been going downhill for a while. And he said, but don't worry, Pastor, she was old. <laughs> and I said, Orville, was she your older sister? He said, no, I'm older than her, but she was really old. <laughs> don't you want to get to be 90 where you can just say anything you want to say to anybody and nobody cares? <laughs> but the truth of the matter, a month ago, Paul was with a family, with Rick. How old was the baby, Paul? Eight months. Largest funeral I've ever done was a 14-year-old boy. On a bicycle, had a wreck, never recovered. I've done 14, 22. I've done 30s. I've done 40s. I've done 50s. I've done 60s. I've done 100. The common denominator for everybody is everybody is appointed once to die. In your line of work, you see it every day. My line of work, I see it every day, and your line of work, you see it every day, and your line of work, unfortunately, you see it all the time. But when you die, the Bible says, after this. Aren't you glad there's an after this? It, it, Paul said this. Paul said, if we have hope only in this life, we're of all men most miserable. Uh, let me give you some, some advice. Uh, the older you get, it doesn't get better. It gets harder. People talk about the good old days. These are the good old days. Listen, once you get past there, it's a job and kids and family and bills and mortgages and all that. You say, Pastor, what is it? It's life. And Paul said, if in this life only we have hope only. If, if in this life, all we have is for this life. Let me explain. Live, work, die. That's what this life offers. He goes on to say, we're of all men most miserable. But see, there's a but in there that says, but we don't have hope in this life only. If Christ is risen, the difference between all religions, and I'm closing with this, of all religions in the world is one great factor. If Christ is risen, Hebrews chapter 2 says we better listen to what he says. If Christ isn't risen, just choose a religion, live, die, you're fine. But if Christ is risen, you better pay attention to what he said. And this is what the risen Christ said, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. You say, oh, Brother Sansel, but they're sincere in their religion. Listen, sincere religion apart from Christ is lost religion. Because only Christ has risen from the dead. Oh, Brother Sansel, I'm moral. Oh, Brother Sansel, I go to church. Moral people and church people, that's wonderful. But if they don't go through the door of Christ, you can't go to heaven through the door of a church or morality. That's why we're not big on church. We're not big on religion around here. But we are very big on relationship. The Bible says, if thou, wilt, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Very simple. With the heart, I believe that I'm a sinner. And as a sinner, I owe a penalty, a sin debt. By the way, there's nobody in this room that would want to stand before a holy God and justify whether or not you're a sinner or not. One sin makes you 
a sinner. One lie makes you a liar. One evil thought makes you a murderer. One lustful thought makes you an adulterer. God is a pass or fail God. It's either all or nothing. There's none righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. But the Bible's greatest news is that Christ came. First, uh, First Corinthians 15, Christ came. He died. He was buried. He rose again. Why? So that you can have forgiveness for sin and hope past this life. Confess with thy mouth. That means call. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in the heart you say, man, I'm a sinner. I don't want to stand before a holy God and give an account of my sin. Uh, But I recognize that Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. And I'm asking you to save me. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not getting better. It's not changing. It's not being religious. It's not going to church. It's not doing any kind of religious things. It's not being baptized. It's looking at a holy God who died, was buried, and rose again for your salvation and asking him to receive you. And the Bible says that whoever comes, he in no wise casts out. See, the thing about today is we could very well be honoring your wife and your family. And this picture would be all we have of Mackenzie because he could be dead. By the way, he called this morning. He's running late. He said, he said, I'd hate to go through all I've been through and have an accident on the way to church. <laughs> By the way, you, you may not make it home. Accidents happen to people every day. Good people, bad people, doesn't matter. Right side of the law, wrong side of the law. Happy people. Who's happy? Those that know the Lord. Those that live by the word of God. Those homes that are built on a foundation that is not blown away by culture and what we think works today may not work tomorrow. Listen, this book's been around since God first breathed into our writers the word of God that they penned on paper and said, let, let, don't let this book of law depart out of your mouth. Don't forget this book of law. Because if you'll do what this book says, the Bible uses one term, good success, happy people. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ, you can live and die. You're not a happy person because you don't know what's beyond this life. But listen, Dr. Hudson, my pastor, used to say you can take a lot on the journey if you know where you're headed. I know in whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Say, Pastor, what about you? I know where I'm going. I'm ready. Do you know? Happy people. A protected people. We support our country, our government, our military, our policemen. We're pro-protection. We're pro-family. Listen, we believe in babies and raising those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Husbands and wives, male, female, producing children, raising them for God's honor and glory. We believe in work and productivity, the sweat of our brow. We believe in helping Hand ups, not handouts. We believe in encouraging people. I love Reagan's quote the best social program he's ever found is a job. And we believe in an almighty God that we'll give an account to with our lives and answer the question what did you do with Jesus Christ? Not what did you do with religion. What would you do with the risen Savior? If Christ didn't rise from the dead, you disprove that, live your life. But if he rose from the dead, you'll give an account to the one who died for you, was buried for you, and rose for you. Heads are eyes are closed. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for these men. It's been a great day. From the sheriff to our last award winner, it's been wonderful to meet these folks and thank them for their service to our community and our country. And Lord, as we close this service and just... Uh, Give folks an opportunity to spend some time in prayer. Give some folks an opportunity to just think about whether or not they're a happy person. Not without trouble, not without difficulties, but with great confidence that God has a purpose and plan for their life. Heads are about eyes are closed. Nobody's moving around. I'm not going to give an invitation for the sake of your convenience and comfort. But I'm going to ask you a question. If you died today, firemen, policemen, Accident on the way home, heart attack, stroke, a number of ways we could step out of eternity. Before one of our EMTs could even get across the aisle to you, you'd step out of eternity. Let me ask you this question. Do you know that there's heaven for you? Uh, let me ask you another way. Would God let you into heaven? Or let me ask you one more way. Why would God let you into heaven? 
What have you ever done that's impressed him? Other than lie, and cheat, and steal, and everything else that all other humanity has done. Blasphemed. Conducted yourself in a way that would displease. A Why would God let you in? Here's the answer because of Jesus. And if you'd say, Brother Sansa, if, if I died right now, I don't know why God would let me in. Would you let me tell you that God will let you in because Jesus Christ loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The greatest transference in human history was where Jesus Christ took your sin and paid for it on the cross so that you could have his righteousness. If you're here this morning, listen. In the quietness of your heart, you talk to God. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. There is no question that I'm not good enough to go into heaven. But as best I understand, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried and rose again, giving me eternal life. And as best I understand, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and to save me. Now, there's so much more to Christianity after that, but there's nothing to Christianity before that. In the quietness of your heart, you and God speak about that. After the service, if you'd like to talk to me or any of our staff, we'll be available. But if you would pray to receive Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. Father, I pray you'd bless our people today, those that have called upon you, those that are seeking to please you with their life. We pray, God, that you would do a tremendous work. And God, I ask you to do for us what we need done in this country. Forgive us of our national sin. And Lord, give us hope for the future. We pray it and we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd invite our ushers to come quickly. If you're a guest right now, don't get nervous. This is just our time of worship. But we must give. Is it at our Sunday morning service? And we'll be dismissed in just a moment. If our men would come quickly and we'll receive our offering. Uh, let me tell you that after this is over, we have a tremendous meal prepared for you. All of our special guests, all of our friends that are visiting today, out this door and out this door. And our men will lead you right to a great meal. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we're so thankful that you're here. Come and join us. If you did not get your gift, there's a couple of men in the back that will make sure you get that. But uh, this is our time of worship. If you're a guest today, uh, no pressure to give. Uh, unless you're running for sheriff, then you ought to give a lot. But other than that, <laughs> but other than that, uh, this is just our time for community folks to give. So uh, let's receive our offering at this time. Father, bless the gift and the giver, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you as you give.
Wonderful. I want to thank Dr. Caceres and the Clearwater Ensemble. If you have any question about the work there at Clearwater or the music department, see Patty. She's Dr. Caceres is here in the back. And make sure the kids stay and eat with us. We'd love to have them. All of our guests, we're going to dismiss through this door in just a moment and through this door, and you'll be given instructions for a great meal. But uh, if you'd like a chance uh, to uh, uh, get with our, by the way, our voter registration lady is in the back. If you have any questions about that. Now, ushers, you come, and let's collect all of our visitor cards. And if you filled out that voter registration card, I want to collect that now. And while they're coming, quickly, gentlemen, move quickly. Let's collect all these. And uh, we want to get all these turned in uh, today. Must be turned in today. And uh, we're going to uh, draw for that gas grill. Brand new, gorgeous gas grill. Uh, we'll do that over in the fellowship hall uh, after the meal gets started. So if you uh, turn in that card, we want to make sure of that. Uh, in just a minute for our dismissal, we're going to invite uh, you to stand in just a moment. And uh, we're going to have the traditional playing of taps in honor of those who have fallen. And then there'll be a rifle volley salute. And so brace yourself for that. And uh, Sheriff, we warned the neighbors so they would know. Uh, but in this neighborhood, they don't care. So anyway, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we appreciate all of you being here today. And uh, make sure we turn all those cards in. Gentlemen, are you ready? Let's stand together, please. For the playing of taps and the firing of the rifle. Thank you so much for being here today. Honor guests, come and have a meal with us. Meet these folks. Thank you for bringing your mom today. What a blessing, Nancy. That's awesome. Be praying for you. God bless you. I love you. You are dismissed. <laughs>